At the end of three years, I decided I'd, I'd had enough of living at home, my mother dominating my whole life, telling me what to do, where to go and when to go. I decided that it was time to move. So at that stage, I left Preston and went and worked in a Braintree, Black Knuckley Hospital in Braintree in Essex. That was a big change and a real cultural shock. Shock. I lived in a, a hostel, a nurses' home hostel, because it was way out in the country. We used bicycles to get around the hospital because part of the hospital was a TB infectious area and we would have spent half an hour getting from one end to the other if we didn't have bicycles. So we used bikes to get around. There was a, a man in charge who was the superintendent who, as far as I could work out, never did any work, but he, he was the superintendent. And though he wasn't expected to work, he was expected to superintend the rest of us. TB was very prevalent, and patients there didn't, in that part, really didn't have much physio at all. They were pushed out on, in beds, onto the verandas, into the sunshine, whether it was warm or cold or whatever the the only time they were allowed indoors or in covered verandas was if it was actually raining or snowing. They lay there. This was the main treatment. They rested. And uh, admittedly there was a fair amount of sunshine down there, so that was good. They were not allowed to read. There was no radio. They were expected to lie flat, not talk, just rest. Some of them were even fed to make sure that they rested as much as possible. And the normal treatment was a minimum of six, six months, probably up to 12 months before anyone would even look or take another x-ray and investigate whether there was, there was any possibility of surgery or collapsing lungs or removing lungs and things like that. The part that I worked in was a large orthopaedic section with... Uh, all the people who had fractured neck ophema, osteoarthritis and those, those sorts of things, they had uh, long-term bed rest, hip spikers that were turned regularly fore and aft twice a day. There were people in plaster beds with TB of the spine that we, we were giving breathing exercises to to just sort of keep them moving, keep them alive. And it was at the beginning of the polio epidemic, one of the polio epidemics, so there were children, a lot of children, with, with severe polio. And these were the long-term severe polio patients which we, we treated because there was schooling there as well so that the children could have schooling. There were people children on traction for, with the perthes and the hips and things that, I mean, they would almost, almost hang upside down, still attached to this one traction unit from, from their, um, in their bed. They could do almost anything. And they would be there for months at a time. Not like today where, when people can, somebody with a fractured femur was put on traction and went to somewhere like Braintree for three months or four months, and then we had this great effort to try and mobilise them and get them moving. Coming right up to today, I, I have a, a relation who had a fractured femur and has had a, a pin or rod put right down their femur, and two weeks later they're home from hospital, partial weight-bearing, uh, in those days that was almost unheard of quite impossible to think about however working at Braintree I found was such a cultural shock I couldn't get home and having lived at home for so long I, I really despite the fact I had wanted to move away from home to lead my own life I did find it quite a shock I could only get home 
for a long weekend when there was a, a public holiday. So after 12 months, I moved and applied and got a job at the city hospital in Not- Nottingham. I became just an ordinary member of staff at that stage and was pushed straight into the um, ma- quite severe polio epidemic. And there wasn't time for any of us. Vaccine had become available for polio at that stage. And that there wasn't time for any of us. We were too busy. Life was too hectic treating the, these children and a few adults. Um, so we couldn't have vaccine because it meant going off work for six weeks at least to allow the vaccine to take place. But amazingly enough, we, we all survived and we all worked and treat, treated these children. I also worked on the chest unit, and there was a large chest unit at the city hospital with masses and masses of chest surgery. We used to do a class of exercises every morning among all the coughing and spitting and whatever. We did a class of exercises to to get everybody mobile and get everybody moving. As many of you will recall, the it was near the Wills Tobacco Factory and there was not the association that um, tobacco was, was a cancer-causing agent, or maybe there was, and it just wasn't admitted. Um, and the, the surgeons were very good at collapsing lungs and removing lungs and removing bits, bits of lungs, etc., and hopefully the patients survived. Some of them did, some of them didn't. But it was a great experience and a very big learning curve. Certainly one to encourage you not to smoke if there was the association. And I mean, I can well remember a young man of of 25 with what turned out to be an inoperable uh, lung cancer, although they tried to operate and he died very quickly afterwards. And he'd worked at the Wills factory since he'd left school at 15. And he'd never smoked. So where where did his lung cancer come from? It was one of the big questions that everybody was starting to ask, but no, no one ever produced answers publicly. Reflecting back, and I now think that possibly that there was the knowledge there, but nobody was prepared to admit it because everybody smoked. I enjoyed flatting in uh, Nottingham. I had a little flat, a very modern flat, above what was called a spiff tailor's, men's tailor's shop. Uh, where all the, the suits and jackets and things had that, that large angular look and uh, padded shoulders, etc., down to a thin pulled-in waist. It was opposite a pub, and I had to go through three other people's backyards to get to my own back door, or my own door, because I had a separate entrance. Most people had, had their entrance through the shop. I was one of the privileged few of that block because I had a, an inside toilet. I even had a bath. Most of the shops in that area, most of the <clears throat> homes in that area had one cold water tap either inside or outside and a, a toilet across the backyard. So I was considered the rich. It was a cobbled street with a tram every three minutes and all the beer was delivered by horse and cart to the pub opposite. So you can imagine it was fairly noisy. It's amazing how one became immune to the noise and you just stopped your conversation for that moment as the the tram went past or as the, the horse and dray went past 
and you just carried on and, and picked it up where you had left left off and in the end you, you just didn't even notice that noise at all eventually I, I was working in there and I decided that I needed to make changes my brother was very interested in my going to Canada as he was married and had a young family at that stage and he wanted to go to emigrate to Canada and he thought that I would go to Canada and if I went to Canada then he and his wife and child children could move to Canada and we could be somewhere near and I would be a companion to Margaret whom I was very friendly with um, but at that stage I decided I'd had enough of family dictating what I would do and I decided it was time that I made my own decisions and moved Can we stop now ready yep at that stage I applied started making inquiries and I applied for a job in the colonial service in, in Hong for a job in Hong Kong I can still remember going down for an interview to a London nursing office I think it was and I was interviewed by a woman that I would call uh, like a battleship in full sail very regal who finally after much discussion with me and the others that were there offered me a job in Hong Kong and it was for a contract for three years but I turned it down she was really really upset and decided categorically that uh, there was no way I was to be ever offered she would personally see that I was never offered a job in the colonial service ever again however I had already decided that New Zealand sounded a nice place and I, I thought I was trying to find out more about New Zealand and in those days there was nothing about New Zealand I could find books in the library that were dated in the 1930s um, no, absolutely nothing at all about New Zealand however I wrote to the physiotherapy board in New Zealand to ask what was the possibility of jobs and to ask what was the possibility uh, of getting registration in New Zealand and that that seemed a very easy process my, my qualifications in um, England were, were just transferable etc so there was no problem there and I was given a list of jobs that were vacant for a fairly senior person as I had become uh, assistant superintendent in the city hospital in Nottingham during my time there and therefore I was going to be eligible for a more senior job in New Zealand I was offered a job at the Wellington Hospital in the chest unit as I obviously had experience from, to deal with surgery I was offered a job in I was told there was a job in Gisborne, in Ashburton and in Invercargill they were all charge physio jobs apart from the Wellington Hospital one at that stage I had this great dilemma but I thought well knowing how difficult jobs were to get in England even in those days I applied sent off applications to all the jobs within three weeks I had offers of all the jobs they would all accept me just on my on merit on my CV that I had written out and gone to great lengths etc there was the quandary what was I going to do now I obviously couldn't accept all the jobs I didn't know anything about New Zealand 
where was I going to go? I turned down Wellington Hospital because the contract were there was for three years and I the other contracts were only for two years with a fair paid one way. Well, I don't know what made me choose Invercargill, but um, it seemed perhaps a more logical place to go. Gisborne looked as though it was a bit out on the map, and Ashburton uh, perhaps what was looking at the map was not quite such a big place. So Invercargill it was. So I accepted the job in Invercargill with my fair paid, wrote and said that I would be willing, you know, would, and they were going to pay the fare. They, were, were they going to send me the money and I was going to book? No, the letter came back. The fare, was, the passage was already booked, and a month later I was on the boat and on my way. This was absolutely devastating to my parents and probably to me as well. However, I departed from Southampton and spent five weeks on a boat on my own didn't know anybody there I had virtually no money I had two trunks which in fact I still possess and two suitcases my brother came up and looked at my suitcases I remember and he didn't approve of my shabby looking suitcases so he actually took my suitcases and bought me two new ones uh, and one of those I've still got as well so that they, they although they're not the, the more modern type with wheels or anything else they've stood the test of time and I still have junk stored in them out in the garage so five weeks on the boat I think I probably felt seasick almost every day I, I don't know whether it was nerves or whether, whether it was um was true seat sickness but I, I remember taking an awful lot of seasick pills in the beginning times and we came through the, the um, Panama Canal stopping at Curacao for an hour or two they were rioting in Panama when we came through so we never stopped anywhere there so we had five weeks just solid on the boat I remember feeling so restless and so um, needing to move and need, not just used to sitting around and doing nothing I really felt quite quite frightened that I would never ever walk or never be active again mm-hmm.